our lives are filled with spiritual connections to one another. How does reincarnation fit into these connections? Find out next as we explore the link between our present relationships and our past lives. Life is an ongoing learning process, and certainly our relationships with other people are a major part of that educational experience. I'm Mark Thurston, and I'm joined today by author John Van Auken, whose written work has introduced reincarnation to thousands of people trying to figure out what makes relationships work. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Mark. In spite of the many, many people who believe in reincarnation, and there must be billions in the world, it's still a controversial subject. Uh, what's the strongest evidence for reincarnation to your mind? Well, for me, when I was a young man, I, it bothered me when I looked around and saw the apparent unfairness uh, seemingly at birth that different people dealt with. Some were born into uh, health and well-being and opportunity, and others were born into terrible situations or ill health. Uh, that unfairness bothered me. It didn't seem like we all got an equal start, an equal opportunity. I noticed that even the, the church had the concept of pre-existence of the soul in order to explain this apparent unfairness. And so that was the thing that I noticed that seemed to support that something has occurred prior to birth that affects the current life. As taught for thousands of years, reincarnation is the process of living through a series of lifetimes for the purpose of soul development. Echoing this ancient wisdom, but with a distinctly Christian orientation, Edgar Cayce discussed this process in nearly 2,000 life readings. According to Cayce, our lives do not begin at the moment of our physical birth. Our natural state is spirit, and in this state we have existed for many millennia. We are souls, not merely physical bodies. For eons, the soul has been undergoing a series of earthly lifetimes in order to experience, firsthand, the cause and effect relationship of free will. In other words, each individual is where he or she is right now because of previous actions and choices. Essentially, the purpose of reincarnation is to discover our spiritual essence and our true relationship with God. From Casey's perspective, Growing spiritual awareness is acquired through our relationships with others. It is by being involved with others that we learn soul attributes such as patience, forgiveness, love, kindness, and empathy. Reincarnation. It's the premise that we've lived before. If we've lived previously, maybe the important people in our lives today are the same souls we've been with in past lives. Perhaps other past life experiences help to create the most positive and the most challenging relationships we face today. Edgar Cayce was a rare spiritual philosopher. He was a Christian mystic, and yet he found a way of understanding and accepting and even teaching reincarnation. What makes his approach to reincarnation special? Well, I would have to say it's so comprehensive, so detailed. That would be number one on my list. Number two would be that its uh, Judeo-Christian orientation really helps. Uh, I don't have to give up that uh, belief, that system that I've grown up in. They actually can work together, and, and I, I appreciate that fact. The third point would be how he shows that uh, in the midst of life situations, physical, relationships, uh, business-wise, there's opportunity for healing and grace and changing what is an apparent circumstance or repetitive pattern that we just have to deal with. You have an opportunity to improve, to make a change. Mm -hmm. The Edgar Casey material suggests that we draw to us people, experiences, opportunities, relationships, in order to help us learn something. And basically that something is to help us to become a better person for having had all those experiences, all those relationships. Now that works in a variety of ways. Oftentimes we draw to us someone who we really admire, someone who we really love, like a grandparent, an older sibling, maybe a good friend. And this person helps us bring out the very best that's within us. Conversely, we also have relationships that really challenge us. 
that really try us, that really make us live up to the best that's within us to learn patience or understanding or tolerance. So we have different kinds of relationships that hopefully bring out the best that's within us, and all those relationships can be a hopeful, helpful, and purposeful experience if we choose to make it so. Now, the kind of feeling that a lot of people are looking for has to do with a romantic relationship. Yeah. People would like to find a soulmate, somebody they've been with for many lifetimes. How do you recognize a soulmate? Well, the problem with the soulmate concept, the way we have it today, is that we focus too much on the mate idea. Souls don't mate. Uh, the real thing about soulmates is that the souls have had experiences together in the past that carry over to the present. It doesn't have to be a mating relationship of the souls. So it's other kinds of relationships that could just as easily be a soulmate. Sure, you two could end up, uh, one of you could be a lyricist that could write the lyrics and the other one the music and the two of you would work together all life very comfortably, very much connected and very familiar with one another. That would be soulmate. So finding different creative ways we've been together? Yes. I think there's a misconception in contemporary society that there's one perfect soulmate out there for me and all I have to do is find that person, and then I'll feel loved and understood. Casey would suggest that we have many soulmates, in fact, dozens of them. Everyone in our life, whether it's a child, or a friend, or a coworker, or a spouse, anyone with whom we have an ongoing connection, positive or negative, is a soulmate. Casey believed that a soulmate relationship was simply a relationship that we picked up exactly where we left it off in the past. People can make and create and build their relationships with each other. And so as they become more and more positive, they move in, in what's classically called sort of a soulmate type relationship. But that's often through a lot of hard work. There's a number of very interesting case histories that seem to illustrate the fact that we have many different soulmates, many different people with whom we've been together previously. In one instance, a young woman asked about her fiancé. Uh, she was getting married later in the year, and she asked Mr. Casey, is this the person, is this the soulmate that will make me happier than anyone else, or is there somebody else? Casey responded that he could name 30 or 40 such people with whom she'd been together before, but her success of her marriage in the present really depended on what she did with that relationship. So it's not that we just have a relationship that's perfect, an ideal soulmate relationship. Instead, soulmate relationships are not so much things that exist, but things that are created through our ongoing interactions with other people. Now, if reincarnation really has so much potential to help us with relationships, how do you recognize a relationship that goes back to previous lives? That's a good question. Uh, according to Casey's perspective, emotion is the key indicator. If a circumstance or an individual elicits a strong emotion in you, either attraction or revulsion, uh, you are probably touching on a deep subconscious soul memory of having experienced relationships with this individual before or this circumstance. We have uh, inside of us feelings about people. When we first meet someone, for example, we may have a feeling of animosity or we may like the person instantly. Where does that come from? According to Casey, these feelings we have about people are stored within our own record, and we're constantly remembering that information. And right now, we're recreating information about our feelings for people in the future. Reincarnation was a concept that came up over and over in Edgar Cayce's readings. However, I don't think it's necessary to deal with the concept of reincarnation in order to get a, a grasp of one's life purpose. I think most of us, without an Edgar Cayce reading, with a little work, can identify relationships that have been difficult and other relationships that have been very positive and constructive if you take away the concept of reincarnation, it's just exciting to approach relationships from the standpoint that I am encountering this person because there's something that I need to learn. 
And then when you add on reincarnation to that, it becomes deeper. The whole thing becomes deeper f from my perspective. But you don't need it to still have that be an idea and a concept that you can work with and grow from. Now, many people have said, you know, I believe in reincarnation, but I don't think I've ever had any past life recall. And really, most of us, most everyone has had past life recall of one kind or another. And it works like this. How often have we met someone for the very first time? And we really like that person. And we had no basis for that. We just met them. Or conversely, we meet someone for the very first time and uh, something about that person really drives us crazy. We feel unhappy. We feel tight, closed in, just by looking at another person. We don't want to be around that person any longer. Casey would suggest that basically uh, we have memories, experiences, with every soul with whom we're going to come in contact. And when we meet that person again, what we do is we, we pop in the memory and we think, aha, there's so-and-so, and this is how you feel about them. We pick up our relationships exactly where we left them off. So all of our relationships of any kind of emotional importance, positive and negative, are a soulmate relationship, and they're an ongoing relationship. Well, if a person comes to me and doesn't believe in uh, past life um, theory, in reincarnation, um, I feel like they could benefit from the technique if they're willing to do it. Once a person quiets down and gets some impressions from inside, they will see that they also get feelings that go with the impressions. And those feelings make it very real what comes to mind. I do think that um, if they don't believe in reincarnation, it might set a seed that says, why not? Maybe this is a possibility. The journey of the soul, as it's described in the theory of reincarnation, is enacted on a cosmic scale. It stretches us to think of ourselves as far more than ordinary physical beings living here on Earth. Many ancient religious traditions and modern spiritual philosophers invite us to see a fundamental principle, the continuity of life. In the process of reincarnation, souls tend to incarnate in cycles and groups. For that reason, Casey believed that we pick up our relationships with others exactly where they left off in the past. If we once learned unconditional love toward another person, then that's where we will begin the relationship with that very same individual in the present. Conversely, if there's someone with whom we've had an adversarial relationship in the past, we're sure to have to deal with feelings of animosity toward that person in the present. Sometimes people will meet someone new and yet feel as though they know them. A man was out in the southwest. It was the times of the gold mines and he's panning for gold. And um, working alone, but uh, one day he got bitten by a snake and an Indian woman saw him from her own group. She saw him and went and saved his life. And they stayed together and she went with him and pan for gold. Um, in the old days, a flash flood came. He could swim, she couldn't. He got to higher ground. He never saw her again. She died. In the 70s, this man again is back in life and he is in uh, Arizona. He's at a party. He looks across the room, he sees a woman, and he just is absolutely taken by her. I mean, we call it love at first sight. When you go to check the story through regression, what we find is that woman was the Indian woman in the past life. And he did know her before. If you want to look at the concept of reincarnation, along with what brings couples together, then the Edgar Casey readings frequently said that people are drawn together repeatedly over past lives and in future lives and that includes not only couples but groups of people who have worked together and family units who have changed their roles with each other one woman had uh, difficulties with her son she had very different philosophical ideas than he did she was very interested in the Edgar Casey information she was very interested in past lives she got past life information on herself and various members of her family and one of the people she asked about was her son. 
Her oldest son was a conservative minister. He thought his mother was crazy. They had very different philosophical ideas about how things worked. And she asked about him. She wanted to know why there had always been this contention between the two of them. Not just about the Casey philosophy, but ever since growing up, they seemed to have different ideas about things. Casey responded and told her that this young man had been a co-worker of hers in ancient Egypt. And the two of them had had very different philosophical ideas. Well, because that's where the relationship had left off, that's where it picked up again in the present. And so when she asked about, well, how can she help him come around to her way of thinking, Casey told her to forget about it, to just love him unconditionally. And eventually, if he asked her questions, then she could answer them, but not to try to force her ideas on him. Well, interestingly enough, eventually this young man, this minister, had a very severe problem with allergies. And he had been to traditional doctors and wasn't getting much relief. So kind of as an aside, one day her mother mentioned, you know, why don't you get a reading from Mr. Casey and see if he can help you. Well, the young man was at his wit's end. He was really suffering badly from allergies, and he decided to go ahead and get the reading. The reading was given. He followed treatment for a few months. And when he felt so much better, he thought to himself, you know, maybe there's something about this Mr. Casey after all. So eventually, that young man got a past life reading of his own. And in time, the mother and the son reconciled their perspectives on the way things worked. And there'd actually been a healing, a healing that had not taken place for thousands of years. Casey's perspective on our relationships is that we need to learn how to heal every one of our relationships with whom we're having difficulty. Each lifetime provides the soul with a series of lessons which need to be learned for soul growth. Those lessons often come to us in the form of other people in our lives. Free will enables an individual to decide whether or not she or he will learn in the present what is next on the soul's educational agenda. But from Casey's perspective, a lesson will be repeated until it is mastered. It isn't so important to know exactly who we've been in the past. What counts is focusing on the present and the relationships, challenges, and opportunities that we have right now. Any person that we have a strong re reaction to, positive or negative, then we are encountering them for a reason. And the reason often is to help us grow. Uh, lots of times we have experiences, or Casey might call them lessons, that we need to experience for soul growth and personal development. And those lessons come to us oftentimes in the firm, form of uh, personal relationships with other people. For example, a gentleman came to me and he said that uh, there was someone at work that he really didn't like, a woman, and to his dismay, other people in the office really liked this person. So in doing some personal reflection, he decided that this very same personality character had been at two previous jobs, and he had tried to avoid them as well in those other places. He decided that perhaps there was something for him to learn in this situation. For many individuals, reincarnation has become something more than just a simple philosophical belief. It's a practical tool for gaining insight into the past and creating positive change in the present. Some therapists are beginning to use reincarnation as a perspective, often with hypnotic regression as a tool. When I do a past life regression, the state of consciousness that I am hoping for is uh, called the hypnagogical state and that just means that it's a state similar to waking up or falling asleep. When we use this technique or this tool called past life regression, uh, it's a change agent tool because what happens is once your mind has in it some conscious information about you and let's say another person in another time, you review your present situation in a different light. Your perspective changes. Every relationship is different, and everyone finds different ways of using the principle of reincarnation to help understand relationships. Reincarnation helps us see that relationships aren't random or haphazard. 
things between people happen for a reason. Not only do we meet people for a reason, but that almost everything that happens to us in our lives has a purpose. Casey suggests that whenever we have an emotional response to another human being, there's something for us to learn. And that something is really tied up in a universal law he suggested goes, like attracts like. We draw to a specific people for a reason, and that reason is to learn something about ourselves. Now, we don't mind hearing that when it's someone we like, someone we love and admire, but how can that be true of someone that we're having a problem with? And that's how is really like this. The people in our lives are there to challenge and prod us to become a better person. So let's say, for example, I've spoken to a lot of people who perhaps tell me that uh, they grew up in a household where their father was very controlling. And then they got married, and maybe their spouse is controlling and overbearing, always criticizing them. They have children, and their children treat them the same way. And eventually, maybe they go to work and have a job, and their boss treats them critically and controlling as well. And the person may say to me, you know, I guess maybe it's my karma. But with the like attracts like phenomena, what may be happening is that this person is constantly drawing to themselves people who think as low as them as they do. So what we need to keep in mind is sometimes people are brought into our lives so we can change ourselves. And ultimately, from Casey's perspective, the only person we can change in a relationship is ourself. Couples are drawn together for, obviously, a lot of different reasons. And a lot of them are related to factors that happened in this life. Edgar Casey would suggest there are at least four points at the heart of all of our relationships. The first point is that all of our relationships have the p possibility, the potential, to be a helpful and a hopeful experience if we choose to make it so. If we decide to learn what we need to learn in this situation, what is this person trying to help me learn? The second point is that all of our relationships are repeated until they're healed. We will continually draw to us the same people, the same types of experiences, the same types of challenges until we've learned from them and transformed them. The third is that as souls seeking wholeness, eventually we need to learn to love and understand every single soul with whom we come in contact. And the fourth is that we learn most about ourselves through our interactions with others. It seems obvious that reincarnation is much more than a belief system. It can be a practical way of dealing with people and events in our daily lives. John, how could our viewers work with reincarnation? Well, uh, first, just be open to the possibility and then see how it would apply in your life. Second, I would say, uh, be aware of the possibility that there are latent talents, latent potential within you and others to change or improve or to touch on a talent that hasn't yet been manifest or they haven't been educated in but it could come to the surface and then third realize that even though there's the idea of karma and destiny there's free will all the time karma and destiny are the result of previous use of free will in this life the situations you face you still have will and you can actually improve the outcome this time by a choice that's such an empowering notion that we aren't predetermined, that karma doesn't mean that we're fated to do this or that, but that we're really shaping our lives right now. That's true. That's true. If you just would take will and engage yourself in a difficult situation or an opportunity and make a choice, you gain by making that choice. And in some way, you may affect a much better outcome than it has been in the past. So no doubt it's big decisions and those little ones every day as well. Oh, it's the little ones more than the big ones usually. Each day, each attitude, each reaction, each word or sentence, those little situations that get at you. The backstabbing, the spitefulness, the uh, word you wished you hadn't spoken, those are the important things to work with. What if you're in a really bad relationship and you have the feeling it must be linked to things from the distant past? What can you do? This is a difficult one. Usually, you can't approach it head on. So you need to use the power of prayer. Uh, since you can't address the issue easily directly, go into your quiet place. Pray about it. Pray for the other person. Pray for yourself. Pray for forgiveness for all the dynamics involved. Mm -hmm. 
then usually a pattern has happened and this pattern recurs you keep repeating the same pattern so you need to stop trying the same things and create a new action plan whatever it is try out something different with this person and this situation also you need to be aware that it may possibly be a purposeful test to help your soul grow very similar to the idea in Job in which the Lord makes a deal with Satan to test Job, to see if Job's heart really is on the Lord's side or just on Job's interest, his own selfish interest. Sometimes in a dynamic situation where it's stressful, the goal is to kind of break out of self's interest and see what would be helpful to the whole here. And then finally, you have no choice but be patient. Things that have taken centuries will take some time to heal. Just have to be patient. I bet a lot of people would find that last one the hardest one to do. Yeah, probably. We kind of live in a culture of instantitis where we want to be right. able to take a pill or do something quick to if heal a problem. If it's not working, divorce it, get rid of it, go on, rather than try to engage it and work through it. In today's society, I think we too easily want to get rid of a relationship if it's not easy or something that we find happy or comfortable. Casey would say that we need to keep working on our relationships until we've transformed them. Now, very often, someone will ask, well, didn't Edgar Casey recommend a divorce sometimes? And the answer, he only recommended divorce on three different occasions, when three different things were happening. If someone's in a relationship where it's abusive and they're in harm physically or emotionally, then sometimes divorce was recommended. Casey would not want anyone to stay in a relationship where they were in danger. The second is that sometimes someone in the relationship, one of the people, has actually learned the lesson, and they can move on without any problem. And the third is sometimes both people have learned the lesson and they can move on. But it's important to remember that if we ever think back on one of our relationships and we think about all the things that happened and we can picture that person and if we think of them and have an emotional response to it, a negative emotional response, there has not been a healing. And until there's been a healing, we're going to have to come back and face this person or this issue again and again and again until it's transformed. So we don't want to end our relationships too quickly until we've tried all we can do to help transform them. On the other hand, we don't want to stay in a relationship in which we're incapable of changing or the other person's incapable of changing. But we need to keep in mind that eventually every one of our relationships has to be transformed and healed. Problems in our outer lives, relationships, money, work, are all mirrors of problems within ourselves. And we face them in our relationships and in the outer world where we get ample opportunities, especially in relationship, to meet our most difficult aspects. What we learn from our relationships, most of all, is what we, what we need to work on as well as what we have to work with. We learn about our own strengths and weaknesses. We learn where we're not patient. We learn where we're not tolerant. We learn what we have to share with other people. We learn about our strengths, what we can share with others. We learn how we can help other people become the very best that we can be. Can we assert our individuality without having it disrupt human relations? Well, I don't think we can put the desire not to upset people first. First of all, I think we need to find out what it is we need and, and speak of that honestly. And if it does upset relationships, it can be a very constructive process. Most relationships don't end because we're honest about what we need. Most of them don't end by us making good choices for ourselves. They end because we've saved up the need to do that. We've, we've lied about what we need. We've suppressed that healthy exercise of will to the point where we finally, when we finally tell people what we need, it's, it's explosive. It just tears everything up. So if we're honest, if we ap apply the will every day in our relationships, yes, it may uh, stir people up and create dialogue, but ultimately I think it makes for better relationships. So it may be an inappropriate fear to worry that if I assert my personal power and my free will, it's going to drive the other person away. What's the main reason we don't do it? Is we're afraid of what will happen, rejection, uh, alienation from other people. I think one of the interesting concepts in the Edgar Casey readings about relationships has to do with the nature of loneliness. That loneliness actually can be a purposeful experience. Sometimes people are alone and they don't have a close personal relationship and they want to know why. Casey said very often it happens for two reasons. One reason is that I'm, I've been suppressing, let's say, some kind of talent or ability or a desire that I have within myself. And maybe I don't think I'm good enough, or maybe I don't think I'm talented enough, or maybe I don't think I'll be able to pull it off. 
Casey said, very often when we're lonely, it's because we're suppressing a soul desire that's trying to come out, trying to express itself. And loneliness gives us the opportunity to reflect on who we are and what we have, what we have to offer other people. A second reason for loneliness, often pointed out in the Edgar Casey information, is that whenever we're lonely, it's a challenge, a prodding, to go out and find someone who is more lonely than we are and try to help encourage and facilitate someone else to become the very best that we can be. And by doing that, Casey assured a number of people that they would draw to themselves a perfect relationship for that individual. I think that the Casey information and the case histories and the Casey files suggest that all of our relationships potentially can be good. But the best relationship we can have is an unconditional relationship. One where we love a person because they're a person, because they're a child of God, because there's the spark of divine in that person, and we love them with no thought of something in return. That's unconditional love, where we just love and accept someone the way they are. Now, too often we want to change people. I've often had the thought myself, you know, well, if that person really loved me, they'd change. The interesting thing about that was when we think about ourselves in regards to other people, we think, you know, if that person really loved me, they'd accept me the way I am. The truth of the matter is we need to come to terms with who we are as individuals and what we need to change, not so much what we'd like other people to change within themselves. And if we really love people, we would learn how to love and accept them the way they are and help support them in changing the things that they need to change. I'd have to learn how to forgive that person and accept that person where they are. I want to be accepted where I am, and most everybody else wants to be accepted where we are, because we can't be where somebody else would like us to be. Well, how can we distinguish between a kind of macho, repressive willpower, and on the other hand, a more healthy, balanced use of the power of will? Well, I think that um, often we, we equate will with, with domination or control, and so it has a kind of a negative connotation, a person who's willful or controlling. And I think that what we need to move toward in understanding the, the healthy aspects of will is the idea of dominion, of working within the context we're in, the people we're in, operating in right relationship with them, and instead of trying to control them, trying to work and cooperate with the system we're in. That, I think, is where the power of the will can best be seen. Does it suggest women might find that easier than men in our culture? Well, I think that women have a sense of how relationships work better than men, but sometimes they don't often um, take an assertive stance that men are prone to take more readily. Personal ideal, as it relates to Mind as the Builder, allows us to establish first what would perfection look like if we could have it. So if we have that settled, firmly settled in our mind, then we can begin to change our attitudes in relationship uh, to relationships from Edgar Casey's perspective, there are at least four things we can do to help transform any relationship. The first is to really learn to love and understand ourselves. Casey suggested that we really need to find out where we're coming from and what we have to share with other people if we want to cultivate friendships with people with perhaps we're having difficulties. The reason that works is with uh, the fact that we draw to us people for a specific reason. We need to figure out what is going on in this situation. Is this person trying to help me learn how to speak up for myself? Am I trying to learn how to be more patient? more tolerant, more loving? Is this person exhibiting a quality or a trait that I have in myself that other people are seeing and I need to perhaps somehow transform? The reason that's important is to learn to love and understand ourselves, is because very often if we think of the people that we like least of all in the whole wide world, if we would only remember that that person somewhere somehow has a best friend, we might ask ourselves, why is it different people perceive different things in different relationships? And the answer really is, is that we need to learn more about ourselves in whatever relationship we happen to be in. The second step Casey suggested in terms of transforming a relationship is something he called setting an ideal. Another way of saying it might be to decide on a motivation. What's a better approach to this relationship than the one I've been working with? Maybe right now I find myself frustrated or angry or unhappy just by being another, around another person. Perhaps I could pick something better like being friendly or being understanding or being tolerant or being patient. Casey suggested that once we pick an ideal or a map or a motivation that's different than the one we've been working with, we actually have the opportunity to have real transformation take place. Things can really change. 
A third thing in, in relationships, Casey suggested, is the actual work. We need to work on improving a relationship, otherwise it's never going to happen. The application. Very often we have relationships where we think, you know, I really should do something about that. But somewhere between the thought and actually falling through, something doesn't happen. The what that doesn't happen is the application. Casey said, if we really try, if we really begin to work with applying things over and over and over again, they'll become a part of our awareness. And the fourth thing to really improving a relationship has to do with something Casey called expectation. If we think this is never going to work, Casey would say you're right. But if we really anticipate the fact that this can change because ultimately the only person that changes in a relationship is myself, you're right. Real healing can take place. So those four things, learning to love and understand myself, setting an ideal, really working on the application, and then the fourth is expect things to change so that they can. I don't want to make it sound too easy. It's anything but easy. But when it's given the time and attention that it needs, change can come. I think people will be given a sense of connectedness with each other much easier in the future than they have in the past. I think there's an energy shift on the planet. I think people's intuitive faculties are developing. What we used to call insights or common sense, people will begin to call developing intuition. Um, flashes of knowing without understanding how they got from one step to another. That's part of intuition. Being able to understand a person's feelings and be able to perceive it. Sometimes thoughts, but I think more feelings when someone's talking to you and you sense a, a sense of compassion, a sense of connectedness. This is going to become much easier as we grow and as human evolution takes us forward in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So I think people who are afraid of it now or feel, well, I can never feel that, can never understand that. Once they start having small experiences, we'll be less afraid of them and that will open them up to greater experiences, more experiences. So I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be very commonplace for people to say, yes, I feel a sense of connectedness with my friend, with my spouse, um, with my pet, even with the plants in my backyard. Ultimately, the best ingredient in a relationship, from Casey's perspective, is unconditional love. Love given out selflessly with no thought of what is received in return. So from Casey's perspective, love is something, an act of giving. It is not so much what I'm getting in return. Love is not what is someone doing for me, but instead, what can I do for another person? Edgar Casey's philosophy has a fascinating principle that we uh, grow to heaven only by leaning on the arm of somebody we've helped. How does service fit into this whole process of karma and past lives? Well, uh, once you actually accept the idea that life is continual and that it's one, that we're all one family, then anyone you meet, any action you do in this life that actually contributes to the health of the family, mm -hmm. to the future of the family, mm -hmm. benefits us all. And that concept is in reincarnation and also is a principle that drives the idea that service in this life to others is important. So that's the key to the healing. Yes, the key to the healing. practical way of living if we use reincarnation as a way to really get us hopeful about the future and not focused on the past. Yes. Reincarnation is the process by which our souls meet the consequences of our attitudes and deeds. It teaches us that there are soul lessons for spiritual development, particularly through our relationships. Those relationships give us the opportunity to grow. In Casey's philosophy, learning how to love is the key to life. In his vision for the future, Reincarnation will be widely understood and accepted, and it will show us that we're going to be part of human history for this and many new millennia to come.